So, um, but no, it's it's uh, my privilege, my pleasure to finish out uh, Focus, um, our series that we started three weeks ago that Pastor Jake started. And uh, if you weren't here, I would encourage you uh, go back online, watch the videos, listen to them on iTunes podcast, however you want to do that. Uh, be sure to catch up on this. The whole idea of the series is built around that idea of resolutions, right? I mean, it's January, new year, new time, start some new things. Um, you know, National Chocolate Cake Day, that's amazing. Um, I'm planning on blowing, no resolution that I set, um, but I'm planning on eating cake today because of that. Um, but it's this idea of like, we all get to choose, and here's the thing, God gives us the freedom to choose what we do with our time, um, who we invest our lives in, what we do with these, these years that God has given us. And uh, we started this idea, this whole series, if you were here on that Sunday, Pastor Jake used the illustration of the bowls and the rocks and the sand, and, and for those of you who weren't here, I'm going to walk through that with us this morning, but uh, for those of you who were, this should look familiar, if you want to watch the whole thing, go online and watch the video, but... He talked to us about how our lives are these bowls, right? And we have the freedom, God gives us the freedom to choose what we put into our bowl. And he said we have a few different things we can put in there. We have the bigger rocks, the larger rocks, and those represent our relationship with God, our relationship with our family, and our vocation, or our calling. The second was the pebbles, the smaller rocks, the stones. Those are the things that we have to do. Uh, like, we have to do laundry, we have to mow the grass, we, we have to do uh, dishes, uh, we have to get the kids up and get them out to school, right? All those things that are necessary functions of life. And then the sand were those things that we got to do uh, on top of all that. Bonus, you know, free time. Uh, what do you do as a hobby, your interests? What are the choices you make? Um, you know, Netflix and uh, Hulu and whatever other opportunities you have, you know, Fortnite, um, all that kind of stuff. Like, what do you do with the extra time that you have? And he said that you have freedom to choose um, what you put in your bowl. And the first thing you put in the bowl is the most important. And so we walked through this illustration of the sand on the left is the, the, the darker sand, and that represented sinful choices. The, the, the clear sand is like godly choices. And so we filled that with kind of the incidentals of life. And, and then we're like, oh, yeah, we got to mow the lawn, do the dishes, you know, uh, get the kids to school, that kind of stuff. And so we like, throw those pebbles in there. And when you do that, and then you come at God and your relationship with God, your relationship with your spouse and, and your vocation last, not everything fits in the bowl. And, and then he did a third bowl where he put those big th rocks in there first. And I don't know how many of you were like me, but I thought there's no way it's all going to fit, right? There's no way it's all going to fit. And so he put the big rocks in there. And I mean, he had to maneuver the three rocks to get them in there. But here's our relationship with God, our relationship with our spouse and our, our vocation, our calling. And then he said, like, okay, we got to do laundry. We got to do dishes. We got to get the kids to school. So he took the pebbles and he poured the pebbles in. And I was like, man, there's still no way. Like there's no time for Netflix and, and you know, Fortnite after this, right? Um, but then he poured all that stuff in and it all fit. And it's this idea that, that God gives us freedom to choose what to do with our time, how we're going to invest our life. And yet, Pastor Jake brought out a verse in 1 Corinthians 3 that says that we will be held accountable for what we do with our time, how we invest um, our talents, our treasures, all of these things. So he, he drew us to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I'm going to paraphrase the first couple uh, verses there, but uh, Paul says that he, we have established a foundation of Jesus Christ. And in verse 12, he picks up and he says, anyone who builds on that foundation and may use a variety of materials, gold, silver, jewels, wood, hay, or straw, those, those are the rocks, the pebbles, the sand. These are the things that we're putting on top of our foundation of Jesus as followers of Jesus. But then Paul says this, on the judgment day, fire will reveal what kind of work each builder has done. And the fire will, will show if a person's work has any value. If the work survives, that builder will receive a reward. But if the work is burned up, uh, the builder will suffer great loss. Uh, the builder will still be saved, but like someone barely escaping through a wall of flames. I don't know about you guys, but my hope and prayer is that I stand before my Heavenly Father, my Creator someday, and I hear these words, well done, good and faithful servant. You, you took Jesus, and you took your time, and your talents, and your treasures, and you put them towards the things of the kingdom of heaven, rather than your own kingdom. And so, Pastor Jake, we've been building this series off this book called Celebration of Disciplines by Richard Foster. Phenomenal book. It's, it's been around for a long, very long time. In the last two weeks, Pastor Jake went through prayer and fasting and study and simplicity and solitude, uh, submission and service. Today, I'm going to hit on confession, worship, guidance, and celebration. Um, I don't necessarily want to dig into any one of those, uh, but I want to take a high perspective, a high view of all four of them. 
You know, we've said we've, we have these inside internal spiritual disciplines, and Foster talks about those first. And then we have these, these outside things that we do, serving other people. And, and then there's these together disciplines, things that, that we do that bring us together as a body of Christ. Now, but since I'm not going to go into each one individually, I do want to spend just a moment on those four uh, just to make sure we're all on the same page with that. Confession is confessing your sins to one another. I don't know if you've ever done this, but uh, it's, it's an incredibly humbling experience to sit across from somebody that you know and love and they know you and they love you and they have only your best interests in mind. And, and you, you confess your sins to each other. I was introduced to confession years ago, um, in early in my walk, and it's a practice that I've held ever since. I, I've got a, a core group of guys that I'm, that are, I'm accountable to. Uh, worship. You know, corporate worship, coming together as the church to, to worship, oftentimes through music, but, but not always, exclusively. Uh, guidance. You know, we all have those questions, and what now, what next? Should I take this job or that job? Should I go over here or go over there? Should I move to this city or this country or, or whatever? And sometimes we wrestle through those things individually, but uh, Foster would challenge us that when you face those moments, you need to come together as a community, as brothers and sisters in Christ, because they're going to have perspectives that you may not have. And then celebration, celebrating what God has done. I mean, you can have a party of one. Like, you can have a party of one all you want. But usually parties are a lot better when you have more people with you, right? And so the idea of celebration is that God has been doing some incredible things in your life, and you want to come together with others to celebrate, not you, but what God has done, to worship God through celebration. And so I just, I, I'm not going to dig into any one of those, but I'm going to do a high view of all four of them uh, under this idea of that there are things that were better together. So as I was working on the sermon, I, I thought of some things that, you know, you can probably do on your own. Uh, things that they realistically, okay, you might do on your own, but it's probably easier together. I thought of uh, moving, right? Uh, moving a couch. I don't know if you have, how many of you have ever moved a couch by yourself. It's usually a little difficult to do by yourself. Usually you want somebody else on the other side of that, right? Um, Ethan, my son, told me I missed a perfect chance to show the scene from Friends with a pivot, pivot, right? Moving is usually better with other people. Uh, riding a tandem bicycle. I've never ridden a tandem bicycle. Um, I have friends that have ridden across the United States on a tandem bicycle. Uh, got chased by a buffalo in Yellowstone. It was an amazing story. In theory, I think you can probably ride a tandem bike by yourself. I don't know. I've never touched it. But it's designed to be done together with somebody else, right? Uh, rock climbing was another one I thought about. Um, about 100 pounds ago, I used to rock climb. And uh, it was a lot easier to haul myself up the cliff then. Um, but when I rock climbed, I'd have a harness and I'd have a rope and it'd go up through, you know, the, the carabiners at the top of the cliff and down into a friend and, and then he would belay me so I didn't die when I was rock climbing. And now I can't get 10 feet off the ground without falling, so I definitely need somebody else. Um, so I recommend that, unless you're Alex Honnold, that's who this is, um, I know it just looks like a random person, but um, Alex Honnold is the world's greatest free solo climber, no ropes, no safety net, nothing. Um, 3,000 feet vertical up El Capitan in Yosemite. Um, incredible. There's a documentary about it. Go watch it. I don't suggest doing it. <clears throat> okay, I'm just saying, like, don't rock climb by yourself. Um, but since I have limited perspective, and I have a lot of friends on Facebook, I thought, well, let's see what my friends would suggest. So I did an online poll. I said, hey, I got this sermon. What are some things you could do by yourself, but they're probably better together? And uh, his friends threw in a lot of ideas. Here's just a few of them. Uh, Teeter-tottering. Um, yeah, uh, I mean, I, you can try it by yourself. I don't know how successful you'll be. In fact, after first service, somebody sent me a GIF of Simpsons and a kid doing teeter-totter by himself out the window. It was hilarious. Um, but I don't recommend teeter-tottering by yourself. Uh, somebody said, uh, going on a romantic walk on the beach holding hands. <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> I guess that's a little weird, right? Oh. You know, usually it's better when there's somebody beside you. Uh, tango dancing. <clears throat> Absolutely. Tango dancing. I mean, tango dancing is so much something you do together. We have a phrase built around it, right? It takes, there you go. Good. Uh, somebody said thumb war. I'm like, yeah, I mean, I'm always going to win. I'm always going to lose. Right. But I don't know what the point of that is. Um, this next one, she, she was one of my volunteers in youth ministry. I'm questioning that, um, position for her after this comment. Um, I'm sure we did a background check, but I might need to do another one um, because she said it's better together to dispose of evidence. <laughs> Not sure what she's doing. Um, 
I, personally, I think it's better to hide evidence by yourself because then you don't have to take anybody else out um, when they're like going to tell the cops what you did. So um, I don't know what she's doing, though. So we're going to run another background check on all of our youth volunteers uh, after this moment. But it, there, there's just some things that are better together. Uh, even King Solomon in Ecclesiastes uh, would agree with that. He said this in chapter 4. Two people are better than one, if they can help each other succeed. If one person falls, the other can reach out and help. But someone who falls alone is in real trouble. Uh, likewise, two people lying close together can keep each other warm, but how can one be warm alone? A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer. A three are even better, for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. If we're honest, though, we tend to push back on this idea of doing things together. Sometimes our ego gets in the way, and we think, I got this. I can do this on my own. It's that, that rugged, individualist, you know, Western kind of mindset. It's the Lone Ranger, right? Spoiler alert, Lone Ranger had Tano. Like, he wasn't even alone. Like, I don't know why we think he was a Lone Ranger. He's always had somebody else with him. But, but it's this idea of, you know, if, if it is to be, it's up to me. I got this. I'm just going to pull myself up by my bootstraps. I don't even know what bootstraps are. Like, what is, what is, I don't know what that means. Um, but here's the deal. If I'm honest, if you're honest, maybe this is just me. Maybe it's just me. Maybe it's not you guys. But I'm my own worst enemy. I'm, I'm easily fool myself. I'm not smart enough to understand everything that's going on in me and around me. I, I feel like I'm, I'm kind of the opposite of Stuart Smalley. Remember him from Saturday Night Live? Looking in the mirror, self-help guru, I'm good enough. I'm smart enough, and doggone it, people like me, right? <laughs> On my best days, I believe that. If I'm honest, there's moments where if I look in the mirror, I got to admit I'm not good enough. I'm not, I'm not smart enough. And sometimes, you know, I'm so self-focused that people really don't like me. Can we be honest? We're all prone to be selfish, aren't we? We're all prone to... <clears throat> to make it about ourselves. We're all prone to have limited perspectives. We're, we're prone to blind spots and biases. We need each other. We need each other to, to move, to ride tandem bikes, to rock climb, to dispose of evidence, I guess. And we need each other to follow Jesus. We really do. I don't know if you've thought about this. And in fact, what I want to do over the next several minutes is I want to build uh, just a, a theological and historical argument for why we're better together. Think of the next several points as uh, stair steps on a, on a stairwell. And we've got to start in the first step, and we're going to move up to the second, to the third, to the fourth. Okay, So everything I'm about to say connects from one to the next to the next. Does that make sense? So let's start here. And these are blanks in your bulletin if you want to follow along with this. God exists in community with himself. God exists in community with himself. And for some of you that are new uh, to Christianity, you're like, what is he talking about? I, this makes no sense whatsoever. How can one person be in community with himself, right? It's a party of one. Well, see, there's this idea that, that you need to understand about the God that we worship, that he exists as three persons in one being, Father, Son, the Holy Spirit. Uh, this word Trinity that doesn't actually appear in the Bible anywhere, but we get the principles of it, that God exists as God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, simultaneously, eternally coexisting with each other in this intimate relational dance. And we, with limited minds, we've attempted to wrap our minds around this trinity, this picture of the trinity, like how do we understand what this looks like? And, and so theologians over years have come up with a few simple illustrations for that. I want to share a couple of them with you. And uh, one is water, right? Water molecule can exist as a liquid, a solid, or a gas. Here's where that illustration breaks down. That same water molecule cannot exist as all three simultaneously. Right? So it has to be either a liquid, either a gas, or either a solid. God the Father, as Trinity, as we understand it, coexists equally simultaneously at all times. Right? So that we, we move from, okay, water, I get it, um, but it's a limited illustration. How about the egg? Uh, so we have three parts of an egg. We have the egg shell, the, the egg white, and the egg yolk. It's all egg. It's all contained in one thing. But here's the problem. It's, it's not all equal. It's different substance. Is different material, different matter. And what we say is God exists as three persons co-equal simultaneously of the same substance. 
And so, so for me, being somebody who used to own a Dairy Queen and somebody who still loves ice cream, um, I thought of the perfect illustration for this. Now, I've never read this in any theologic, theological book. I didn't learn it in seminary. So this could be like genius. And if it is, I want credit for it. I'm just going on public line statement. Like, I get credit for this. Pay me any royalties, right? If it's heresy, I didn't come up with this. Um, <laughs> but uh, Neapolitan ice cream, right? Neapolitan ice cream. It's all ice cream. Chocolate, strawberry, vanilla, all coexisting. It's all the same substance. It's all interacting. You can't tell where one begins and one ends, but it's all ice cream. I thought you guys would be more excited about that one. <laughs> <clears throat> They're just thinking about chocolate cake. They're like, who cares about ice cream? Let me, let me give you scripture, okay? Let me give you scripture rather than my thoughts. Uh, Genesis 1. In Genesis, first book of the Bible, one first number when you count. Genesis 1, actually verse 1. So the first verse of the first chapter of the first book of the Bible, we see that there's a plurality in this Godship. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and so we have God the Father. The earth was formless and empty, and darkness covered the deep waters, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. So we have God the Father, and we have God the Spirit. But we don't see God the Son in this verse. And for some of you, some of you think that Jesus, as second person of Trinity, showed up for the first time at his birth in the manger in Bethlehem. And you would be so wrong in that. You see, God, as Jesus, second person of Trinity, existed before time began. In fact, he played an integral role in the creation of all things. Colossians chapter 1, Paul tells us this. Christ, Jesus, second person of Trinity, is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him, God, the Father, created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through Jesus and for Jesus. He existed before anything else, and Jesus holds all creation together. You have to get a bigger picture of Jesus. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And so the, 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 the Bible geek in me, the theologian, the philosopher, the skeptic, um, when I learned this years ago, all came to the same question. Is there ever a moment where all three are functioning simultaneously, interacting with each other? There is. There absolutely is. Jesus' baptism, we read in Matthew chapter 3. It says, as soon as Jesus was baptized, Jesus' second person of the Trinity, God the Son, as soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water, and at that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God, third person of the Trinity, descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my son. Who calls people sons but fathers? This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. God the Father speaks to the crowd about God the Son, with God the Spirit alighting down on his son. Three persons in one being. That's our, our first step on our stairwell. We step on that and we, we move up a level to another step and we read this, that we are made in the image of God. We're made in the image of God. Uh, theologians call this imago Dei. It doesn't mean that you have the physical characteristics of God and you don't physically look like God. Even you people who spend way too much time in the gym, you don't look like God, Okay. But it means that we have some of the characteristics, some of the attributes, the personalities of God. Not, not all of them. We aren't God, but we're made in the image of God. And for the sake of our conversation today, I, I want to limit that Imago Dei to the fact that it means that we are relational beings. If God is in a relationship with himself and we're made in the image of God, then we are made as relational beings. Let me illustrate this. Go back to the first book, to the first chapter, to the creation of all things. Chapter 1, verse 26, God said, let us, notice the plurality, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. So we see this moment where God has created everything, and it's all good. He's created light and darkness, and it's good. He's created the stars and the planets and the universe, and it's good. He's created water and dry land, and it's good. He's created trees and shrubs and plants and vegetation, and it's good. He's created animals of the sea and animals of the land, and they're good. And he creates Adam, and it's not good. He's, he's scooped down. He's picked up some dirt, and he's molded it into the first man, and he 
breathes the breath of life into Adam. And he sets Adam in Eden, the perfect world, sinless world. And he's given him a task. He says, I want you to name every animal. And we don't know how long this takes, maybe days, weeks, months, possibly years for Adam to do this. But he's been given a task to name all of the animals. And everywhere he goes, he sees two of every kind of animal, male and female. And he sees them every day for months, years possibly. And you've got to wonder, at some point, did he, did he ask, why is there nobody who looks like me? Why is there nobody who, who walks like me? Nobody who talks like me? And so for the first time in all of creation, God looks down and says, it is not good for a man to be alone. Chapter 2, verse 18. He says, I'll make a, a helper suitable for him, who's just right for him. Now, if you want to wrestle with something that I've been wrestling with for years, here's a good philosophical question to go home and talk about over lunch. Adam is in a sinless world, in Eden, has the full presence of God with him. God is interacting with him as a friend. And yet God wasn't enough for Adam. Because Adam was made in the image of God, and God is a relational being, Adam needed to be in relationship with someone like him. And so God looks down and says, it's not good. So he causes Adam to go to sleep. Rather than scooping up dirt like he did for Adam, he, he takes a rib out of Adam's side and forms Eve differently than how he formed Adam. Out of his side means side by side. And he forms Eve, the first woman, and Adam wakes up from the first surgery post-anesthesia. He's a little groggy. He's not really sure what happened. And he's looking around, and his eyes land on Eve. And he says some of the most poetic words in all of Scripture. Here now is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. Remember, he's been given a task to name everything. And so he looks at her, and he says, you shall be called woman for you came out of man. In Hebrew, the word for man is ish. For woman, it's isha. I almost wonder if Adam woke up from surgery, looked over at Eve and went, isha. <laughs> right? And all of a sudden here, in this moment, Adam was no longer alone. And the word that, that God uses in the scriptures to describe Eve is the word azer, E-Z-E-R in Hebrew a helper, a helpmate. It's not a, a statement of inferiority. Adam is not superior over Eve, but they're side by side. That's why he took her out of his rib. In fact, that Hebrew word azer is used of God in the Old Testament. So the scriptures refer to both God and Eve as helper, helpmate. Adam is now complete. God exists in community with himself. We're made in the image of God. And then thirdly, God's people have always existed in community. I don't have one or two scriptures for this because this spans the entire Old Testament and New Testament and into church history. But I just want to kind of do this historical walkthrough, this narrative of, of God's people. In the Old Testament, we see from Adam and Eve are formed families, and these families become tribes, and there's tribal families. You see Abraham and Lot and all of those, those early people. And they would be nomads, and they would travel around with their tents and their livestock and live that nomadic lifestyle. Uh, well, over time, that formed into 12 tribes that formed the nation of Israel. That nation was led into captivity in Egypt, and Moses led them out of that. And they lived in the wilderness for 40 years in community with each other as tribes. And in this wilderness experience, God instructed them to build a tabernacle to put at the center of the camp. And all 12 tribes circled around God at the center, made him the most important thing in their, in their existence but the 12 tribes worked together to, to travel, to go to war eventually, to form a kingdom. We see Solomon or David and or Saul and David and Solomon and other kings, and we see this kingdom of, of nation of Israel. And if you know church history, if you know Old Testament history, you know that they were attacked and deported off to many other lands. And yet they maintained their, their national identity. It's so one of the unique things about the nation of Israel that through centuries, even though they didn't have a land of their own, they were people without land, they maintained their identity as the people of God. But go back to the Old Testament, we see them uh, spread throughout the nations. And then we see them under a Roman uh, Empire. 
and by now synagogues have developed, local houses of worship where the Jews would get together to wrestle through the scriptures and come together to pray. And we see Jesus arrive on the scene, and Jesus is like fully God and fully man. He can do this whole thing on his own, and yet he chooses to invite 12 men to be his apostles, to spend time and do life with them. Theologians say that even from 18 to 36 months that these 12 men walked and lived and learned from Jesus. Jesus lived in community with other people. And we see this, this idea carry on to the early church fathers and the establishment of house churches and elders and, and even heaven. I mean, you fast forward to the end of the book, Revelation, at the end of the story, we're all in eternity with God worshiping together. If you don't like people, you're probably not going to like heaven. I'm just saying, right? Because there's going to be a lot of people there. So God's people have always existed in community. And also the, the study of God's word has always happened best in community. Acts chapter 2, we see the early church, this beautiful picture. It says that all the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to sharing in meals, and including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. Fast forward a little bit to Acts 17, and we see... Paul, as he's traveling from one town to another, uh, we get a glimpse into his mindset, his leadership, his influence. He says this that in verse 2, as was Paul's custom, meaning he did this all the time, he went to the synagogue service. He, he could have come into a city and just isolated himself, and just done his Jesus thing, right? And yet he chose not to. He went to the synagogue, and, and for three Sabbaths in a row in this particular city, he used the scriptures to reason with the people. And then go forward just a few verses to verse 11. It says that the people of Berea were more open-minded than those in Thessalonica. They listened eagerly to Paul's message and they searched the scriptures together day after day after day to see if Paul and Silas were teaching the truth. Friends, this is why we talk so much about life groups. Why we believe that, that being in rows on Sunday morning is good, but this is the starting point. This isn't the end point. Your, your, your growth, your pursuit of Jesus doesn't stop by coming to church on Sunday morning and sitting here. You need a place where you can wrestle with the scriptures, wrestle with your faith with other people. And so that's why we talk about life groups every Sunday. Because we want you sitting in circles, not just rows, so that you can study this stuff on your, on your own. Uh, for the next few minutes, I want to I just kind of walk through how this has played out in my life. Um, I, don't, I don't share this to pat myself on the back. Um, I, I, I don't want that. I'm just saying that community is such an integral part of my spiritual growth that it's come in various forms in my life. And maybe some of you are in experiencing some of these things and some of you are not, and, and that's fine. But maybe these, these pictures of my life uh, may encourage you, inspire you, challenge you to begin to live your life in community with other people. So as I thought through the, the different communities in my life that have helped me grow in my faith, uh, the first one I thought of immediately was my family, uh, my wife and my kids, right? It's one of the reasons why we stress all the time, date and marry somebody who shares your beliefs, because your spouse will influence you spiritually more than anybody else. Anybody else. And if you don't agree on who Jesus is, you don't agree on this faith thing called Christianity, you're in for trouble in your marriage. I met a godly woman in college. We were in campus ministry. Uh, we shared beliefs and values, and, and we got married, and we built our life around being Christians, living according to the word. Does it mean we're perfect in that? No, not at all. Nowhere near perfect in that. And then we had kids. We brought kids into the world. I don't know what we were thinking, um, but we brought kids into the world. And all of a sudden, God learned from Scripture that it's my responsibility to make sure that they are raised up in a Christian home. And I didn't grow up in a Christian home, so I don't know what this looks like. And so we're just kind of winging it. We're figuring out as we go as they're young, right? And I've learned over the years, like, how I study and grow in my faith is not how my wife studies and grows in her faith. And how Ethan and Morgan grow in their faith, Right? And so some people have looked at, at me and my life, and they're like, wow, I bet your house is exciting. So they're studying Old Testament history, cultural context, Roman Empire, all that kind of stuff, Greek, Hebrew. I'm like, my family wouldn't listen to me if I started talking about that stuff. There's no way. What I've had to do as a father, as a spiritual leader in my house, is figure out how does my wife grow in her faith, and how can I help her in that? How does my son grow in his faith, and how can I help him do that? How does my daughter grow in her faith, and how can I help her do that? And it looks different for each one of those. But my family is probably the most uh, integral uh, tool that God uses to grow my faith. Uh, beyond that, um, there's a group of guys uh, that I have invited into my life. Uh, they have unprecedented access to me and my time. Uh, they get more time with me than anybody else does outside of my family. 
And, and, and I've invited them in to encourage me, to hold me accountable, to challenge me in my faith. And they've invited me into their world for the same thing. And, and so we spend a lot of time together. And we, we wrestle through things. We're group chatting all the time on text messaging. We're, we're getting together over coffee and meals. And, and we're calling each other out on the good things and the bad things. Not just the bad things. Not just, hey, I, you failed at this. But those moments where we see him do something incredible. And it's like, hey, I love the fact that you date your wife so well. Like, that's something I need to improve on. Thanks for being a model for me, right? Hey, I saw you handle that situation with your kid. And I know it wasn't easy, but you did it with grace and love. And I really, I just want to make sure you know that that was seen. And I value that. Guys, I, I can't do this Christian life without guys like this in my world. You know, just a simple illustration of this. We uh, uh, did a bike trip, all of us except for Justin, and he couldn't go. Uh, but the other four of us, we did a bike trip. Some of you heard me talk about it. But rode from Pittsburgh to D.C. last fall, 350-some-odd miles uh, over the course of seven, eight days. And, and guys, just very practically, I couldn't have done that on my own. There is no way. Not because of the physical challenge, but because I don't know how to fix a bike, right? Like, I'm just being honest. I am not mechanically inclined. Like, there were things that went wrong with my bike, and I just went, ah, hey, guys, can you fix that? I'll, uh, I'll pray for you as you do it, right? <laughs> and, like, seriously, they were doing stuff, and we had this moment of transparency. We were leaving Washington, D.C. early in the morning and wanted to avoid traffic, and I'm driving, and it's dark, and... And I was just thinking about the last seven, eight days we were together, and it just hit me like there was no way I could have done this on my own. And I just, I verbalized that. I said, guys, thank you for being part of my world, because this whole thing couldn't have happened without you. And I began to cry, because they meant that much to me. I mean, do you have people in your life that, that you have invited into your world to hold you accountable, to encourage you, to walk alongside of you? Do they have unprecedented access to your life? at a peer level. Do you have this next one? Do you have a mentor who you've invited, somebody who's older and a little bit farther down the journey? Have you, do you have somebody who pours into you on a regular basis? Uh, this uh, next picture is Lauren Trethway. Some of you know, uh, have heard me talk about him. Uh, I am who I am today because this man poured into me in my 20s and my 30s. He died four years ago. Um, I've yet to replace him. I'm taking applications, but it's most likely going to be denied. I'm just letting you know because he set the bar super high. Um, he was an incredible man. Uh, when I was in my early 20s, um, I was part of a church that he was an elder in. It's my last church that I was a pastor at. And he saw something in me, and he invited me into his world. And his world looked like 6 a.m. at Panera on Wednesday mornings. I didn't know 6 a.m. existed. I was just out of college. Like, I, nights were great. Mornings, not so much, right? And he's like, no, we get together, we study the Bible at 6 a.m. Seriously? But I went because it, was in a, it, it wasn't a group that you could just join. You had to be invited into this group. And he extended this, this hand and said, hey, we want you in the group. And I was the youngest one in the group. And, and I'm, I'm participating. And all of a sudden, he's like, hey, can we get together outside, Chris? He's like, I just want to pour into you a little bit extra. He didn't do that with too many people. And it was an honor and a privilege to have one-on-one -on -one time with Lauren. And he began to just teach me what it meant to be a man of God, a spiritual leader, a, a husband, a, a father, a pastor. And he wasn't a pastor. He was a state farm executive. But he knew Jesus, he knew leadership, and he, he knew how to live a life well for Jesus. And even as he died four years ago of pancreatic cancer, even as he, he went through that horrible disease, he taught us all how to face death with hope because of our faith. And do you have a mentor, somebody who's pouring into you? You know, he poured into me, and as a result, um, one of the things I love is pouring into the next generation as well. Students, college students, millennials. Uh, one person that I've had the privilege of that many of you guys already know is uh, Pastor Brandon, who just left a week or two ago to go become a police officer in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Uh, I, I had access to Pastor Brandon in ways that many of you didn't have access to him. You know, we, we served together, we worked together, we prayed together, we cried together, um, we, we had an office together. We spent a lot of time together. And one of the great joys that I saw was as I poured into him, one of the people that he poured into, not because I told him to, not because I asked him to, but because he saw something in my son, and my son connected with him, and so he poured into Ethan. So Lauren poured into me, I poured into Brandon, Brandon pours into Ethan. Do you see where I'm going with this? You need people that are your peers, like accountability partners, hold you accountable, ask you the tough questions. You need older people farther ahead on the journey who are, work, who are investing in you. You need somebody that's behind you a little ways that you're pouring into as well. Uh, because of Lauren's influence, I also have uh, this group of guys. It's a men's group. 
Um, we meet at Panera on Tuesday mornings at 6. This is actually Bob Evans, um, not Panera. Uh, Justin was leaving to go to Minneapolis, and we wanted pancakes and sausage and eggs instead of bagels. So we went to Bob Evans. But this is a group of guys. Like, I've been doing this for 25 years because of Lauren's investment in me. Is that right, 25 years? Math might be wrong on that a little bit. 18 to 20 years. I, I've been meeting with a group of guys Wednesday mornings, once a week, to study scripture together, to pray with each other, to take what we learn on Sunday mornings and wrestle through it together, to be invited into each other's lives. Do you have a, a community like this? You know, is it your life group, co-ed, women's group, men's group? And then do you, are you really invested in this church? You know, this next picture is from youth group, and uh, so I, I use it only as an example of a microcosm of the larger church family, right? But this is our youth family, our youth church, and so we, we had a moment where we came around one of our students who's leaving to go to Thailand for three months, and we just came together as a church to, to pray over her, to encourage her, to, to do life along with her. Uh, that's one of the great benefits of being part of a church family. When, when you take that step to really invest yourself in a church family, you see incredible things happen in your, in your spiritual growth. Karen and I have talked often, if I wasn't a pastor and we moved to another town, the very first thing we would do is, is find a, a church family that we could be a part of. Because there's so much life that comes from being a part of a church like this. And so are you invested in this church? Now, I also, as I wrote this, I had to be honest with myself. You might have noticed um, over the years that I am an extrovert. I like people. I like being around people. Um, I get energy from that. I also know that there's these people called introverts. I don't understand you guys, but um, I know you exist, right? And so I understood that I have a limited perspective, limited, limited view of this whole thing of living in community with other people, right? Because I'm an extrovert and I thrive on this. But some of you are looking at these illustrations. I've gone like, oh, oh I couldn't do that. There's no way I could do that. I married an introvert. Like, we have a really unique marriage. Like, she posted on social media a week or two ago. Um, she, she goes, you know that phrase, go big or go home? Uh, she goes, you seriously underestimate my desire to go home. It's literally the one thing I think about all day long. <laughs> like, that's all I want to do is go home, right? And so I, I married a woman whose favorite thing to do is to be home by herself, and I'm a guy that wants to be out with all the people, right? And so we wrestle through this in our own home. And so since I don't understand you introverts, even though I've been married one for 23 years, um, I threw it out, another poll on Facebook, right? And introverts had a lot to say, just not in person. Like, they just, <laughs> like on social media, they shared it to me. It was like 47 comments on this thing, right? And uh, in fact, I thought, of, I thought of this image. I've seen it before. Um, introverts unite separately in your own homes, right? <laughs> but uh, I, I kind of sifted through, and there was one quote uh, from Aleshka, she's a former student of ours here, um, been connected with our youth ministry over the years. She's in her mid-20s. And she wrote this, community means something different to me than it might to an extrovert. Doing life with others, to me, doesn't look like spending my evenings at events or with large groups, but rather sitting with someone or even just a few individuals over a meal. I find that as an introvert, it's not that I don't value relationships. Listen to what she said next. This was fascinating to me. She goes, it's not that I don't value relationships. It's almost that I value them to the highest degree. That to me, it feels exhausting and like a disservice to the people I'm with to be divided between so many people that I can't fully invest in anyone. What a beautiful picture of an introvert. You know, the introverts still crave and value and seek out community. They just do it in much deeper ways than we as extroverts do. In fact, I think they may do it better than I do because they're going to invest deeply in a few key people. So whether you're an introvert, whether you're an extrovert, the Bible would say the same thing. You need people in your life to follow Jesus, to walk along this journey with you. We're made in the image of God. Our, our God that we worship is in existence with himself, in the relationship with himself. We need each other. We're better together. Now, imagine like me, many of you love superheroes, right? And, uh, you know, you can't get enough of the super. I know, that was a hard tangent, wasn't it? But you can't get enough of superheroes. 
Um, Snowball was last weekend at the high school, and uh, Brandon Bogue, who is the youth pastor at Christian Union Church, was the speaker at the non-denominational service. And so we had some students that were leading worship and students that were attending, and then I know Brandon well, and so I, I went and observed, and, and he is a, a DC comic guy. Um, right? I'll forgive him for that. But he's a DC comic guy. I'm a Marvel guy. Um, he's a DC comic guy, and he loves Batman. Batman's like his favorite. And he actually used this illustration. I thought it was really good, so I stole it. So thanks, Brandon. Um, he, he said, you know, everybody thinks Batman is like this, this loner, this crime-fighting loner. He goes, Batman was never alone. Batman had Robin, right? And, and we can question, you know, Robin's abilities as a crime fighter. But, you know, I didn't even know that Brandon knew, of course, because he's a DC guy. There were like four or five or six different Robins through the years. Yeah, Genevieve knows. I'm like, I didn't know that. All I knew was that he had Alfred. Alfred was always Batman's backup, right? Like, Batman, hey, Alfred, can you send the car? I made a mistake. I'm stuck. I need help, right? He's never alone. And he had Gordon, Commissioner Gordon. He had the entire police force. Batman was always with people always had, had somebody fighting crime with him. So I'm not a DC guy, I'm a Marvel guy. So as I thought about this, I'm like, yeah, Batman's cool. The Avengers are so much cooler, right? And plus there's like all of them fighting side by side all the time. So as I was sitting there in, in the blend writing this message, I thought, I, I gotta show this scene from Avengers. So here you go. <laughs> What's the story upstairs? The power surrounding the cube is impenetrable. Thor's right. We gotta deal with these guys. How do we do this? As a team, I have unfinished business with Loki. Yeah? We'll get in line. Save it. Loki's gonna keep this fight focused on us, and that's what we need. Without him, these things could run wild. We got Stark up top. He's gonna need us to... So, this all seems horrible. I've seen worse. Sorry. No, we could use a little worse. Stark, we got him. Banner? Just like you said. Then tell him to suit up. I'm bringing the party to you. I, I don't see how that's a party. Dr. Banner. Now might be a really good time for you to get angry. That's my secret, Captain. I'm always angry. a chance to hear the Hulk roar on this sound system. So <laughs> that, was, that was just bonus. So, But hey, seriously, like, like superheroes, like Avengers, we need each other. Here, Captain America, right? How are we going to do this as a team? We got to do this together. That circle up at the end there, and we're going to fight this together. Guys, we need each other to follow Jesus. We can't do this on our own. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that you are a God who has given us uh, God, just a, a church family that we can do life with, that have has given us people that you've placed in our lives sovereignly to, to speak Jesus into our life, to remind us of what your word teaches, to encourage us, to challenge us. Father, may your spirit convict each one of us to just open our life a little more, whether we're an introvert or an extrovert, uh, but just to invite others into this journey knowing that they have a different perspective, a different giftedness, a different way of looking at you that we need, and they need us because we're better together. God, we thank you. We pray those in the name of Jesus. Amen. <laughs>